this rocket's burning bright will soon be out of sight and orbiting in space. Even Chris Hadfield admits his grasp has exceeded his reach. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I've, I've had my lifelong dream over-fulfilled. Over-fulfilled with a third trip to space and it's a big one. Six months aboard the International Space Station. And for three of those months, he'll be the commander of this multi-billion dollar multinational orbiting behemoth. Hello, Chris. The first Canadian to be in charge up here. What little kid doesn't want to fly a rocket ship or, or command a spaceship? I grew up with uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, but even maybe more influential, Star Trek, uh, you know, with, with James Tiberius Kirk commanding the Enterprise. The full-scale mock-ups of the space it station. It is surprisingly large. Yeah, it takes up a lot of room. The, the most amazing thing is is coming across this in orbit. You know, <laughs> to, to have this star that is getting bigger and bigger, and it turns into something that is yeah. this big. Let's go into node two. Okay. Whoa. So this is your home in space. This is, in fact, these are sleeping berths, and this is the full size of the uh, inside of the space station. This is uh, node two. It's kind of a central block that the rest of the station plugs into. So how big is the station? It's huge. I mean, it's, uh, it's like a five-story house. You know, and it goes all the way down there into the Russian segment. And, uh, and then it's got the T on the front of the two laboratories. Why don't we uh, go through into the Japanese module? This way. Okay. All right. It's going to be much easier floating in space. It would be really easy. Over and float yeah. <laughs> this is the Japanese module, the Japanese experiment module, their laboratory, really. And it's big. It's a big it's volume. Yeah, yeah. They got some plants working here. Yeah, they have mock up of all different types of experiments. Now, we've got another one that way. Yeah, this, this way to Europe. Okay. All right. Coming into the uh, European module over here, Columbus. This is really just absolutely packed with, uh, with different experiments, uh, life uh, science experiments. Well, what's neat about this is that there are experiments on the ceiling as well sure. and on the floor. So you can work up, up here as well as you can work there or you can work down here. Well, you, you and I could be working next to each other with the one with feet up and one with feet down. And it's just uh, you just get used to the fact. I want to see the bridge. The bridge. The bridge yes. uh, follow me. It's to the left. I can. Coming now into the main sort of command laboratory and the real heart and brains of the whole part of the space station here into the U.S. lab. And even though this is just a mock-up, for security reasons, that's as far as I can take you. We're getting closer and closer to your actual launch date. Is it, is, does it have a sense of reality for you that it's really happening? You're, you're really going to be up? I. You know, I think about it, of course. Uh, when am I going to let myself believe that it's real? Because I don't ever want to measure my success or failure by that rocket working. I have to be completely comfortable with myself for the rest of my life, no matter whether I get to space in this flight or not. So therefore, I, I kind of keep myself in denial uh, and try and enjoy the training and all the people. The first two times that Chris Hadfield flew in space, he went up on American space shuttles, but they're no longer flying. So this time, he's going up on a Russian Soyuz capsule, which looks like this. And down here is where he's going to be during launch and landing. Believe it or not, that is a three-seater spacecraft. Chris is going to be in the left-hand seat over there as the pilot. This metal ball technology hasn't changed since Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, flew in 1961. But it's reliable. Just because it's simpler doesn't mean it's worse. And, and they really recognize in Russia that better can be the enemy of good enough. Whereas in the American parlance, better is better. And you want things, the next one, to be better. But uh, sometimes if it's good enough, then let's just build another one of those because that works pretty well. And inner space is not that important for what is only a two-day trip to the space station, especially if you're staying for six months. There is one Canadian who already knows what it feels like and what Hadfield is in for. Bob Thirsk had a view pretty much like this when he lived aboard the ISS for six months in 2009. The heart, uh, the muscles, and uh, the bones. Those are the ones that atrophy. Uh, and the changes that they undergo are perfectly adaptive to spaceflight. But of course, the difficulty is you have to come back home at the end of the mission. And that was really difficult for Thirsk. 
For the first few days, I had difficulty maintaining blood pressure to my, um, to my heart and to my brain, so I felt a little bit woozy, felt awfully fatigued. If you'd asked me to go in and put in an eight-hour day at the office, I could, couldn't have done it. And I had diff a little bit of difficulty walking. I'd walk with a wide space gait. I'd need someone to hold me uh, by the elbow to guide me around corners uh, for the first couple of days or so. My flight surgeon was concerned, and he actually didn't give me my uh, car keys for uh, two weeks after I, I got back. So you know, my balance and orientation and judgments were just, uh, my spatial judgments were, were off for one or two weeks. And that was after six months in space. Imagine the effects after a two and a half year mission to Mars. I want a good pulse of about 70 or so. So it's been, what, six months since you did this? Looks like you haven't forgot anything. Yeah, I forgot everything anyway. Okay. No, you're doing great. Okay. Great is something Chris has been for his 20 year career as an astronaut. But I want to make sure when we're coming up, let's the face it, that our, um, they don't send up the merely okays or the good enoughs. It's cool only the best that get a ticket on this ride. And two would have been a great career for Chris Hadfield. It wasn't necessary to fly in space a third time in order to feel fulfilled. I almost instead feel an obligation to fulfill this role, to do this thing right. Uh, I would not have felt hard done by if I didn't get a third space flight and command a spaceship. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. If not necessary, then maybe destiny. Like thousands of little kids, Hadfield dreamed of being an astronaut. The thing is, he did it. By doing all the things you have to do along the way to become an astronaut, air cadets, military college, advanced degrees in science and aviation, Air Force, all because he wanted to go to space when he was nine. That little tickling voice, that little uh, uh, constant uh, pleasure center of delight that this is what that nine-year-old kid dreamed about doing um, is there all the time. I've learned to suppress it because it takes so long, but I'm planning to turn that kid loose when I get to space. And when Chris Hadfield turns that kid loose, he plays guitar. He's always taken one to space, but this time it's part of his mission. Hadfield and Ed Robertson of the Bare Naked Ladies have written a song about space flight, and it will be recorded while Chris is in orbit. It's a good start. I like Not it. Not a bad start, right? <laughs> It'll be really nice to be able to play music, to try and uh, capture the experience as best I can, uh, not just taking pictures or, or writing a blog or poetry, but actually trying to capture a little bit of the experience uh, through the art form of music while I'm up there and to be able to share it then with, uh, with people and students specifically right across Canada. It's, it's just a great side project to be involved in. So those chords, that's a D, that's it, like an, an A with the string off, like a Stan Rogers A. And this is why I interviewed Chris in a country bar not far from the Johnson Space Center. For the first time on television, a preview of Is Somebody Singing? or ISS. It goes like this. On solid fuel and wire, turn the key and light the fire. We're leaving Earth today. But it's not the nine-year-old kid who will be in command of the International Space Station. It will be the veteran Canadian astronaut from Sarnia, Ontario. And in the words of his childhood hero, James Kirk, boldly going where no Canadian has gone before, to command a spaceship. Push back in my sea. We started off with a, a small core of astronauts that didn't have a whole lot of experience. We flew only with Americans on board the shuttle and had limited roles and responsibilities. Now, with Chris taking over the commandership role aboard the station, we're doing everything. Those who have an idea of what drives Chris have no doubt he has the right stuff for this mission. Jeremy Hansen is our next generation of Canadian astronaut. I think overall it's a contribution to society that drives someone like Chris Hadfield. He wants to do his best and give back to, to Canada and to society in general. And I think we've seen him do that. He's really made a good name for Canada down here in the, in the space program. 
and uh, we owe him a, a great deal. Look out my window, there comes home. At this stage of my life, I am just so delighted that the opportunity is there. All of the skills, the things people have taught me, the, uh, the opportunities I've had that hopefully I can do this job really well on behalf of myself and on behalf of our whole country. If you could see, wait to hear this, our nation from the International Space Station, then you know why I want to get back soon. For The National, I'm Bob McDonald in Houston. You know why I want to get back soon.